Hello, HeroQuest was MB Games' attempt to bring D&D-style fantasy to the mainstream masses, families more familiar with Hungry Hippos and Buckaroo than the GIF and the Brew. And it worked. HeroQuest sold hundreds of thousands of copies worldwide and turned a generation of kids into massive Warhammer nerds. Even if you're one of them, you might be surprised at how the game came to be. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm grabbing a torch and casting light into the darkest corners of the history of HeroQuest. HeroQuest and its sibling Space Crusade have been massive influences on my gaming life. I literally don't think I would be in the hobby today if I hadn't inherited or stole, depending on who you ask, copies of both games from my older brothers. They opened the door to fantasy and science fiction and just the concept of playing games in a way that I couldn't imagine before taking the tops off and looking at all of those incredible components within. In this video, we'll be looking at the history of HeroQuest from its first inception all the way to global domination. If you enjoy it, please feel free to give it a like or even a super thanks. HeroQuest would pit up to four adventurers playing a dwarf, a wizard, a barbarian and an elf against an evil wizard who commanded a rogue gallery of monsters in his dark and terrible dungeon. It was inspired by the likes of role-playing games Dungeons and & Dragons and RuneQuest, both of which Games Workshop had produced content and miniatures for, and was intended to capture the same kind of family-friendly demographic as another GW game, Talisman, but with more of traditional role-playing flavour than you would get in that fantasy dice roller. The game also sought to take visual cues from sword and sorcery films like Conan the Barbarian. The game was produced by MB Games before they were a part of Hasbro, and if you want to find out more about how they came to be in the market for Games Workshop's help, developing fantasy and science fiction board games, then you can click here and look at my history of Space Crusade that goes into great detail. But if you haven't seen it, here's the long and short of it. Former Games Workshop store manager Stephen Baker was brought into MB to help with playtesting on some of their games. This led to Baker being offered a full-time position in the design team, where he worked on testing and development for a number of MB releases, including 1987's Mystery of Old Peking, a clue-based game of detection, and 1988's Incognito, a clue-based game of deduction. If you're wondering, no. At the time, Hasbro did not own the rights to Cluedo. Baker had ideas of his own, and wanted to develop a new fantasy board game that would draw on his experiences playing Dungeons and & Dragons and Warhammer. He set about convincing MB Vice President of Research and Development Roger Ford that there was a market for a fantasy board game, and he was aided in this by the success of the fighting fantasy books that Games Workshop co-founders Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone had been publishing since 1982. With the rising interest in fantasy gaming and the lucrative evidence of D&D and fighting fantasy, Ford gave the go-ahead. MB then looked to Baker's former employer Games Workshop for help with developing the idea further. In particular, they wanted to use Citadel miniatures to bring the game to life. Interestingly enough, GW had been brought in to talk with MB prior to these HeroQuest conversations. About what exactly, we don't know, but as Baker describes it, things dovetailed with what he had been advocating for, and the collaboration on HeroQuest began. Stephen Baker designed HeroQuest with Games Workshop support in miniatures, art, law, and playtesting. In a 2020 interview with Mojo Nation, Baker stated that his intention for HeroQuest was to capture role-playing in a box, and to act as an introduction for players to new RPGs and fantasy gaming. MB Games, being a company traditionally associated with family board games like Bookaroo and Hungry Hippos, were keen to target the same family market. This game would sit in game stores right alongside those other titles, and would have to be playable by kids as young as nine and their families. A decision that arguably led to HeroQuest's massive success. This meant that things had to be kept simple, with pick up and play quests that didn't require any prep ahead of the game, and the rules couldn't get too complex. In early versions of the game, that target wasn't quite nailed, and it took several rounds of revisions with extensive playtesting from school kids and the design team at Games Workshop, helping to refine things to get the right pitch. 
Baker was also keen that the game look suitably immersive. The miniatures for monsters and heroes that Citadel's sculpting team were working on was part of it. But like any person who spent too long on Made.com, he wanted something more. He wanted furniture. The plastic and cardboard furniture pieces included bookshelves, chairs, tables, treasure chests, and even a torture rack. And along with the upstanding doorways, they add an incredible depth to the dungeons that these adventurers are exploring. They may not be the best thing about HeroQuest, but for me, there's no doubt that they helped elevate the entire experience. One major change was that in early versions of the game, the dungeon was actually created using separate floor tiles for the rooms and the corridors. This would become a mainstay of GW dungeon crawling game design for many years to come. But Baker found that in the playtest groups, the kids who were using those rules couldn't find the right pieces or it took too long for them to build out the dungeon. It just wasn't fun and the game ground to a halt. So he decided to switch things up and create one large predetermined board. Over a long weekend, he used an Axis and Allies three panel board to create a massive prototype map. And whilst this improved the game substantially, the cost for three panels proved too much for MB to bear. The map board was retained, but at only two panels in size. In a 1989 interview with Games Review, Baker also mentioned that the prototype version of the game stayed closer to typical RPG rule sets, and even included character creation rather than the four pre-generated heroes from the final box. Reducing the board size may have reduced costs, but I can only imagine that this was not a cheap game to produce. The box is absolutely chock full of content, which might explain why its proportions make it impossible to store alongside any other game on a shelf. As well as that big board, there are 27 monster and 4 hero miniatures, push out card components for all those door and furniture pieces with plastic bases and clip on pieces, decks of treasure, quest monster and spell cards, hero boards, a mountain of tokens to represent stairs, rubble and traps of all kind, and two rule books. One for the rules themselves, and one for the campaign of 14 quests. This also included pages that would allow you to design your own adventures. A capability that would later be expanded with the European release of an adventure design kit that included a book of blank maps and adhesive stickers representing furniture, enemies and traps so that you could torment the heroes in any way you saw fit. HeroQuest was released in the UK, Europe and Australia in 1989 and then underwent some additional fine-tuning before being released in the United States and Canada in 1990. The slightly altered version that found its way to North American shores would see a subtitle added to the box. This was the HeroQuest game system now, and there were other changes too. The evil wizard was renamed from the original Morkar to Zargon. The quests were made more difficult, with more monsters, rule tweaks, and the heroes even had weaker spells. Plus, the evil player even got some dedicated chaos spells, a set of 12 spells that certain enemies like the Warlock could use against the heroes. In a 1989 interview with Games International, Stephen Baker said that the game was designed around the notion that the target market of 10 to 12 year olds would probably play in a less cooperative way and go for a more competitive approach. The original first quest in the quest book, The Maze, supports that idea, as the heroes race against each other to escape the dungeon first. But perhaps by the time the US version of the game was being designed, Baker had reconsidered the notion. The Maze was replaced with a new first quest, The Trial, which called for more cooperation between the heroes and set a different tone for the game. This quest substitution would also be retained for the UK and European reprints. Releases in other markets also saw localised rule tweaks, mostly supervised by Stephen Baker himself. But the Japanese version, well, that was something else. In 1991, the game was published by Takara in Japan, with changes even more significant than those seen in the US. In the Japanese version, the game world is quite different, with no good wizard guiding the heroes and a villain called the Grim Dead. Even more impressive, the evil player takes on the name the Demon King. Even Chaos Warriors get a facelift, becoming Dark Warriors. But it's not just names that changed. Pretty much every rule system and mechanic was altered in some way, and the quest book is reshaped to introduce more advanced rules as the players progress through them. The Japanese version has long been considered a game almost unto itself a very different experience to the rest of the world's hero quest. 
Although there were other creative personnel involved in testing, refining, and illustrating HeroQuest, it has always been said that the game was designed by Stephen Baker. Stephen Baker designed HeroQuest. See, even I said it. But just for completeness, I wanted to draw attention to a comment that was left on the Eldritch Epistles blog. On a blog post about a set of unreleased metal miniatures that had been found in a bag in Brian Ansell's collection in 2014. Minis that were believed to be prototypes, or at least playtest pieces for HeroQuest. A comment was left by a user claiming to be Brian Ansell that says this. Stephen Baker, Roger Ford and Ben Rathbone had damn all to do with HeroQuest's development. Stephen Baker had produced a poor derivative of Dungeons & Dragons. Games Workshop had to be called in to perform a rescue mission and deliver an actual game. We did that. We were paid for delivering an actual game that actually worked. We used nothing from the Stephen Baker version. Stephen Baker managed one of our shops. I have no idea who Ford and Rathbone are. In the time since then, the user who left the comment has deleted their account. It's now listed as being posted by unknown. And we don't even know if the account ever actually belonged to Brian Ansell, or if he meant exactly what it seems like he did about Stephen Baker's contribution to the game. However, in an entry on his blog, Games Workshop writer and Wolfrup designer Graham Davis recalls sitting in on development meetings for HeroQuest, wherein he names Jervis Johnson as the game's designer. In pretty much every interview and piece of marketing since the game's release, Baker is always credited as the only designer, with the apparent sole exception of the preview pages for HeroQuest in Games Workshop's monthly magazine White Dwarf, issue 115, released in July 1989. Here, it clearly states that HeroQuest was developed using the talents of Stephen Baker and Jervis Johnson with artist John Blanche. Now, this is Games Workshop's own magazine. It would not be surprising if they wanted to inflate or hype up their own creative personnel. So, we don't know for sure what the real story is, and whether or not Stephen Baker did create HeroQuest solely on his own, or if there was perhaps more support and involvement from Games Workshop than has really been confirmed or admitted to over the years. What is agreed by all is that Games Workshop were largely responsible for the story and world of HeroQuest. The game is set in the Warhammer world, but there are enough inconsistencies that debates about the canonicity of the game have raged for decades. A map of the old world is included in some rulebooks and other HeroQuest content. There are mentions and missions in locations like Karak Varn, the World Edge Mountains and Bretonia. The heroes regularly work in service of the Empire, and the Witch Lord and Morkar himself could even be adepts, colleagues or alter egos of some of Warhammer's timeless enemies. Did the Witch Lord go to school with Drakenfels? Did Morkar hang out with Heinrich Kemmler? I guess we'll never know for sure, but for my money, given that the game is based on legends and epic myths, the entire Hero Quest adventure could take place in almost the prehistory or early history of the Warhammer world and the Empire itself. These are legends that have been misremembered over time, so some of the facts don't quite line up with what we know to be true in the current Warhammer world. One interesting note is the story of the name Morkar. Firstly, there was a real Morkar, an English Earl who in 1066 supported King Harold and earlier marshalled the force from the Men of Nottingham, and given that Nottingham is the home of the GW Design Studio, it stands to reason that this could have influenced the name. And then in the time since HeroQuest, a slightly different Morkar has been seen in Warhammer lore. He was the first ever Chosen of Chaos, and he was defeated by Sigmar himself. Sigmar, at the time, being a barbarian. It's like poetry. It rhymes. The miniatures in HeroQuest were sculpted by the Citadel team, including Bob Naismith, Ali Morrison and the Perry twins Alan and Michael. According to an interview with Naismith by user Thantos at Ye Old Inn, the unusual bases for HeroQuest were perhaps unsurprisingly a product of needing to fit into the squares on the game board, even though early previews showed the miniatures on round bases. The team were able to start from design and sculpts for the Chaos Warrior and Gargoyle using suitable releases from the recent Realm of Chaos range. There's a lot of Chaos Warriors in that early range that share similarities with the Hero Quest sculpt, but arguably one of the closest is the legendary Slambo. Though Slambo, of course, would never be seen on shift in the dungeon without both of his mighty axes. 
The gargoyle is presumably a rework of a greater demon of corn, aka the Bloodthirster, and given that title, it's no surprise that the name was changed for this family game. But it's not the only gargoyle seen in Warhammer history. In fact, there was even a regiment of renown released in 1985, the Flying Gargoyles of Barda. These guys have a great little story, I may well come back to them in their own video at some point. The decision was made to allow multiple weapons to be added in the moulds for the goblins and orcs so that there would be more variety in the set, and they were joined, of course, by mummies, zombies and skeletons. A few Fimir were also included in the set, before being quietly shuffled to the background of Warhammer lore. Arbiter Ian actually has a terrific video on the history of the Fimir, but suffice to say that despite looking ace, they never fully caught on, and the more problematic parts of their backstory may well have held them back. I love the Fimir models, I think they're ace, and I've actually got a set of the Forge World releases from a couple of years ago sitting on my bench waiting to be assembled. It was part of a project I was working on to update the miniatures for all of the Hero Quest range so that I could play with contemporary monsters and heroes on that traditional board playing the traditional rules. That's a project that I'm going to try and finish off this year, so I may well do a video on that as well. But what about the heroes? The Barbarian is an absolute unit, clearly inspired by the fantasy tropes in the Citadel range and general fantasy content of the time. This is Conan in all but name. 2021's Warcry Red Harvest set included a chaos-worshipping Dark Oath Savage who bears more than a passing resemblance to this mighty HeroQuest warrior. Unlike his kin in Advanced HeroQuest, the HeroQuest elf does not carry a bow. Also differing from his contemporaries, the HeroQuest wizard forgoes the classic Gandalf look in favour of a younger 70s rockstar appearance. And then there's the dwarf, a classic design to be sure. The HeroQuest dwarf is modelled on the White Dwarf himself, icon of Games Workshop's magazine. The cover of the 1987 White Dwarf issue 90 features an incredible piece of art by John Sibick, which was then turned into a model by the Perry Twins. Sibick's art is used on the hero card for the dwarf in HeroQuest, and the miniature is modelled after it as well. That bag of prototype miniatures that I earlier mentioned were found in Brian Ansell's collection? Well, that features a range of different takes on the heroes. The Ziploc bag simply had HeroQuest scrawled on it, and initially it wasn't clear if they were prototypes for HeroQuest, Advanced HeroQuest, or Talisman. GW sculptor Jess Goodwin recalls that he sculpted several of these minis, and has a theory that maybe they were the first generation of test sculpts for HeroQuest used during the early development of the game. They were then replaced by a set much closer to the final versions, and those were the prototypes that were painted and used for the box art. One unusual thing is that this set includes a couple of knight adventurers, one sculpted by Goodwin and another likely sculpted by the Perry Twins. Of course, no knight ever joined the party of Mentor's heroes, so evidently the concept was dropped quite early in the development of the game. The covers for Hero Quest and its UK expansions were painted by the incomparable Les Edwards. These pieces are truly incredible, evocative of an era of fantasy that has fueled the genre for decades. Great heroes in tremendous peril and defiant to the end. And at the same time as capturing the epic, cinematic feel of the game, every one of these pieces is dynamic and intricate. They all seem to have a hundred small stories to tell alongside the central action. Legendary artist Gary Chalk was responsible for much of the beautiful card art in HeroQuest. Each illustration is rich in detail and brings this early Warhammer world to vibrant life. Perhaps more impressive than the card illustrations though are the card backs. The monster card is just the right side of foreboding without being overwhelming. As amazing and timeless as all of the art in HeroQuest is, there is one set of cards that might be amongst my favourite fantasy art of all time, the spell cards. These four elementals are deeply rooted in my gaming psyche. When I think fantasy, these are one of the first things I see in my mind's eye. Just incredible pieces. The design for these exceptional elementals was inspired by the Citadel C-34 Elementals range released in 1984. Another set that I've added to my long list of must-owns. Chalk also illustrated the marvellous game board, bringing a vibrancy and clear distinction to the different rooms across the map without overcomplication or garish colour combinations. 
Hero Quest. Face battling barbarians in a maze of monsters. I'll use my broadsword. Fire of wrath. Hero Quest. Now with two new adventure packs. What an incredible advert. They literally do not make them like that anymore. According to Simon Bamford from MB Games, this was the most expensive Christmas advertising campaign that they had ever undertaken. It cost almost £500,000 for that 30 second advert to be released in September of 1989 in the run up to Christmas. And it worked. The game sold more than 126,000 copies in the UK alone, at an RRP of around £25, meaning that they made more than £3 million just in the UK. That's before we take into account all of those other markets that HeroQuest was released in. And the critics loved it too. It was very successful, receiving very positive reviews almost across the board. It even won 1992's Origin Award for Best Graphic Design in a Board Game. One thing I've not been able to confirm is whether or not that is Christopher Lee's voice in the advert. I really hope it is, and if it's not, whoever it was does an incredible Christopher Lee impression. One other thing that you can see in the advert is the card text for Fire of Wrath. Sorry, Fire of Wrath. And it basically says that a player can destroy doors and furniture. So presumably another rule from that early playtest version of the game that gave players the ability to change the board through destructible terrain. The game would receive a considerable number of expansions, but like the base box itself, the territory you were in would dictate what you would get access to. The first two expansions, Keller's Keep and Return of the Witchlord, were designed by Stephen Baker and the UK team, whoever else was in it, and they were released worldwide, but they came out at different times. Keller's Keep provided players with a new campaign of 10 quests that would see the heroes descend into the Lost Dwarven Keep to bring aid to the Emperor. Much like Commissioner Gordon, he seems to have sent literally his entire force into an underground trap, where they are now in danger of starvation. A raid against our noble warriors are more greenskins than ever, with 17 goblins, orcs and fimir included in the box. New tokens provided more traps, and there were even stronger doors made of iron. In the UK and Europe, the pack came in a flimsy cardboard box that opened at the top. But in the US, Australia and some other countries, the box was a much sturdier two-piece construction that allowed the entire lid to be lifted off. Interestingly enough, this also accommodated a rulebook that had switched orientation, and had harder cardboard covers which meant that they were able to print 10 cutout artifacts on the back and 4 new alchemists potions on the front. One change that confuses me though is the touch-ups that seem to have been done to the cover art. It's still the same piece on the cover, but the US version seems to have been lightened and simplified, with the background and some of the expression taken out. I just wonder why. The second expansion was Return of the Witchlord. The pesky Witchlord had survived his final encounter with the heroes in the base game, and fled to an ancient fortress of power to rebuild his strength. This expansion was my favourite, not least because it comes with new board tiles that you lay over the top of the main board. The throne room is a really nice way to add some fresh variability to the classic board, plus it has an enormous skull painted on it. And the other tile is a rotating chamber, very cool stuff. The pack also comes with a load of new skeletons, zombies and mummies, and yet more tokens and doors. Like Keller's Keep, it also included the bonus cutout tokens and cards on the covers in the US edition. In the UK, Europe, Australia and New Zealand, there was another expansion. This was Against the Ogre Horde, an epic pack that introduced a completely new enemy type, ogres. These chunky lads represented a new force that was threatening the Empire, and so the heroes are sent to find and infiltrate the fortress from which the Horde is operating. The new Ogre miniatures felt massive, and you got four warriors, a champion, a chieftain, and an Ogre Lord, a mighty array of foes to battle in the new set of seven quests. The box also included more tokens, stone doors, and a few new floor tiles for you to use on the main board. Of particular note was the new entrance tile set outside the dungeon. You actually got fresh air for a brief moment in this one. The final expansion released for the UK and European markets was the Wizards of Morkar. 
Australia and New Zealand didn't get this one for some reason. In this pack, Morkar had assembled a who's who of evil sorcerers, each wielding their own evil magics. A high mage, a necromancer, a storm master, and coolest of all, an orc shaman. Each of these evil sorcerers received a new deck of spells. And with those new spells came new spell tokens like magical barriers and earthquake tiles. The quest book promised the most dangerous quests yet, but fear not heroes, for this time you have backup. As well as new spells for the heroes to choose from, there are also 12 men at arms miniatures, with interchangeable weapons. A wonderful addition to the game that adds an extra layer of strategy. For some reason though, there were only 5 quests in the Wizards of Morkar quest book, but there was another way to get even more questing action. In 1990, the UK and Europe would see the release of an expanded edition of HeroQuest. In an attempt to break the minds of anyone not paying enough attention, MB released HeroQuest Advanced Quest, which is not the Games Workshop Advanced HeroQuest, we'll get to that. No, this was a reissue of the base HeroQuest game with some additional content included. The men at arm miniatures that would later be included as part of the Wizards of Morkar were included in this advanced quest box, but not as henchmen hireable by the heroes, instead they are the Black Guard, a set of elite enemy warriors. In a quest to be played at the end of the regular quest book, called the Dark Company, the heroes would face a 13 stage adventure played across a map the size of 4 complete boards. Other rules such as wounds being retained across board sections and spells not refilling except by special means meant that this would be an epic undertaking, a suitably cinematic finale for players' campaigns. In North America, the expansions took a different route after Keller's Keep and Return of the Witch Lord, deciding instead to focus on one hero at a time. These packs were developed by a US based design team and didn't have the involvement from Stephen Baker or any of the team responsible for those European releases. The first NA expansion pack would be centered around the Barbarian, and it would include a new quest book, The Frozen Horror. The pack would include 10 new quests three of which were intended for the Barbarian to play solo. As well as the obligatory extra tokens, the pack also had new cards and a range of new floor tiles that included frozen rooms and glacial exteriors. And of course, there were new minis, a female Barbarian miniature available to choose as a hero, and four of the Men at Arm minis that had been made available by other expansions in the UK. As well as these, there were some new ice-themed monsters. Three ice gremlins, two ice yetis, two polar war bears, and the frozen horror itself. Sort of like if the Grinch had decided to imitate Vlad the Impaler instead of Father Christmas. The cover art for the expansion was provided by artist Rick Grayson. The second NA expansion was all about the elf. This elf quest pack included a campaign called the Mage of the Mirror, and like its barbarian predecessor, it included 10 quests, three of which were for the elf alone. Plenty of the new spells, tokens and treasures were also included, along with some new floor tiles and a new 3D wall that showed the magical mirror itself. There was a female elf hero in the box, along with elven warriors and archers who could support you on your quest. For the evil wizard player, there were new enemies, in the form of ogres, taken from the UK ogre horde pack, giant wolves and an archmage. A dangerous foe indeed. The art for this pack's cover was illustrated by Don Kuka. So, there were packs released for the Barbarian and for the Elf, but that was the end of official support for the game in the North American market. But that can't be right, surely. There must have been a Wizard and a Dwarf pack somewhere along the line. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. Well, until relatively recently, we didn't know for sure. But thanks to the sterling detective work of Toka, whose blog I have linked below, and Ye Old In contributor Luca Pashi, we now know what was intended. Luca was able to source verified design documents for those missing expansions, the first of which, the Wizards pack, would have been called the Sinister Sorcerers. This pack was the furthest developed of the two, and would have seen the Storm Master from the Wizards of Morkar leading a dungeon full of monsters to stop the heroes from recovering the Tome of Darkness, a terrible spellbook that has fallen into Morkar's hands. The pack would presumably have followed the same quest route, with some solo quests and a regular campaign, and it also would have featured new chaos spells from Wizards of Morkar, a new female wizard character, new evil sorcerers, minotaurs, and heartbreakingly, some new rat men. Ratmen for HeroQuest! I can barely believe it. 
But thankfully, in Toko's research, they discovered that the ElfQuest cover artist Don Kuka was also commissioned to produce the cover for this pack, as well as for some of the monster designs. Don Kuka shared some of those sketches with Toko, which you can see here, Ratman and all. There was also an unused concept piece by Frozen Horror cover artist Rick Grayson that showed a dwarf using a massive hammer. Totally awesome stuff, and I'd recommend checking the link in the description to see all of them on Toko's blog. And what then of the dwarf quest? pack. This was less developed, but would have been called either the Hammer of Hadraka or the Curse of the Hammer. In it, the heroes would descend into a lost dwarven empire in search of the famous magical hammer that can unite the splintered dwarven kingdoms against Zargon. The pack would have included the Ogre Command miniatures from the UK Ogre Horde set, as well as a stone elemental, very cool, giant spiders, and a range of worms and rock moles. It would also have had a female dwarf hero and some new dwarf warriors included. Interestingly, the mechanics and tiles in the set would apparently have included tunnels through which you could move across the board. Although the expansions for the UK and US markets were developed independently, there was clearly always a cost-saving intention to use miniatures from one to fill out the enemies and heroes of another. Unfortunately, the cost-saving just wasn't enough and MB Games felt that there was not a big enough profit margin on the expansions to continue development and to release those final two. Apparently, even the Elf and Barbarian quests received limited playtesting because they were rushed out just to make sure that they were actually made to market before the entire line was cut. And speaking of unreleased things, illustrator Terry Oakes, who worked on several Fighting Fantasy book covers and painted the outstanding Space Fleet box cover for Games Workshop, was commissioned to produce a piece for a 1990 expansion for HeroQuest in the UK. It's not clear exactly which expansion this was to be for, especially given that Les Edwards provided the art for all the European releases. So ultimately the art went unused. One bit of art that did see shelves though, was the HeroQuest 1991 Marvel Winter Special comic book. This 36 page comic featured not just a full comic story, but also new hazard templates that you could cut out of the cover, a new quest for you to play through, a miniature painting guide, new monster stats, and more. The quest, Revenge of the Weatherman, just sounds so funny to me. I don't recall the Weatherman having turned up before this quest, but just the fact that whoever he is, he's now decided to quit his job predicting the forecast, and instead wants to get revenge on the heroes. Sort of like an evil Michael Fish. 1991 also saw the sticker company Merlin produce a HeroQuest sticker album that required 215 stickers to complete. The album included several HeroQuest stories as well as a great big map of the Warhammer Old World. Honestly, you'd think MB Games were in league with the corner shops near primary schools with the amount of HeroQuest stuff they were releasing for them. And you could add to the magazine shelves Games Workshop's White Dwarf as well. In issue 134, the heroes could descend into the rat-infested halls of abandoned dwarf hold Durag Doll. Finally friends, we get Skaven Warriors, Rat Ogres and White Seers in our Hero Quest dungeons. Plus, a troll who is about to have a very bad day, as there are also rules included for a new hero, Dwarf Troll Slayer Killy Thekerson. In issue 145, we are treated to a rematch with Ogres, Chaos Worshipping Ogres, with the aid of henchman Pierre Chancier. The heroes head into an ogre-filled dungeon to get revenge for Chancier's fallen comrades. These quests, along with an absolute ton of fan content, have been hosted by the archival site Ye Old Inn, a resource that has been absolutely invaluable to me during the making of this video, and has served fans of HeroQuest for many, many years. I thoroughly recommend, when you finish this video, going to check out what they've got on their site, because it's really great stuff. If you want to learn more about HeroQuest, it's absolutely the place to go. But we're not done yet. Corgi Books published three novels focusing on the characters from HeroQuest. Written by Dave Morris, these were an interesting set of books, not just traditional fiction, but filled with mini expansions for the game as well. Morris has had a long career in genre fiction, Notably writing the 1990 fighting fantasy book The Keep of the Lich Lord. This would go on to be reprinted as part of Morris's own Choose Your Own Adventure series, The Fabled Lands. The first of Morris's HeroQuest books, published in 1991, 
was The Fellowship of Four. In a 2016 post on his blog, Morris mentions that when he was first commissioned to write the book, he couldn't recall if the game had a formal setting at all, which accounts for why the map he developed and some of the place names are different to those that would ultimately be included in the final game. He also mentioned that at the time, the game was called Hero Quest, not Hero Quest, which I don't know, I just find interesting, I guess. As well as the story of our four heroes taking on Morkar, the book also included a short choose-your-own-adventure in the night season. The second book, The Screaming Spectre, published in 1992, would follow a young wizard whose mentor, lowercase, has fallen into a magical torpor. This is the only one of the HeroQuest novels that I have actually read, and when it came to Beyond the World's Edge, the included choose your own adventure section, I suffered the same fate I did with every fighting fantasy book, an ignoble death with pretty much every page turn. This book also included a new adventure for the Hero Quest game, a solo quest for the wizard that would pit him against the evil player in a one-to-one -one duel. And finally, in 1993, The Tyrant's Tomb was released. By the time of this novel, the HeroQuest game was considered more firmly entrenched in Warhammer's world, a world that itself had only become more and more detailed. And so, Morris made sure to reference more things from Games Workshop's universe, including the likes of Chaos, the Norse, Bretonia, and even the Lizardmen. This book again featured a choose-your-own-adventure, The Treasure of the Khan, as well as a new quest for the game, A Growl of Thunder that would see the heroes rescuing an injured compatriot. Dave Morris has very generously released the text for these books and the Choose Your Own Adventures for free on his blog, so I will link that in the description below. But if you want to play HeroQuest solo and don't fancy flipping back and forth through a real book, you could instead choose to play it in the form of a video game. Gremlin Interactive released the first game in 1991, and it was a faithful adaptation of the board game, even crediting Stephen Baker as designer. In 1994, Gremlin released a sequel, HeroQuest II The Legacy of Sorosil. This entry expanded gameplay, allowing the player to recruit a team of heroes whose skills could be customised, and it even allowed for multiplayer games with up to four players taking turns to progress their heroes. And on we go from Puzzles Digital to Puzzles Actual. MB Games took the opportunity that they had with such incredible fantasy art to produce a range of HeroQuest jigsaw puzzles. The puzzles provided unobstructed but still cropped views of the Les Edwards cover art for Keller's Keep, Return of the Witch Lord, Against the Ogre Horde, and the Adventure Design Kit expansion packs. Here is my effort at completing the Witch Lord puzzle. Games Workshop didn't rest on their laurels in 1989 though. They followed up their collaboration with MB Games on HeroQuest with a solo effort, Advanced HeroQuest. This wasn't quite a sequel, it took quite a few development steps away from HeroQuest, so it's more like the way that Galaxy Quest is a continuation of Star Trek. Given his involvement in the development of HeroQuest itself, there should be no surprise that it was designed by Jervis Johnson who of course would also go on to design Advanced Space Crusade and many other games for Games Workshop over his illustrious career. Advanced HeroQuest is a wonderful dungeon crawling experience. It goes back to those individual floor tiles that Baker mentioned from the early HeroQuest prototype. It improves, expands and changes hundreds of other aspects to build a completely new gameplay experience. And along with its sole expansion, Terror in the Dark, it's a stepping stone from HeroQuest to Warhammer Quest. But this is a game that deserves an entire video to itself, so suffice for now to say that Advanced Hero Quest evolved the GW dungeon crawler from its family-friendly roots in Hero Quest and took the brave, heroic, and downright sensible choice to center the action on Skaven. In 2002, the trademark for Hero Quest was acquired by game designer Greg Stafford. This was the man who was behind the setting for the original RuneQuest RPG that had been around when HeroQuest was first coming together. In 2003, under his Isseries Inc. company, Stafford used the trademark to release a new edition of what was the Hero Wars RPG that had been designed by Robin D. Laws and released in the year 2000. This new HeroQuest RPG was set in the same world as RuneQuest, Glorantha, home of the brew, and received a second edition in 2009. 
The RPG, despite the name, had no connection to the HeroQuest board game, and Stafford even said that he had always intended to use the name HeroQuest for a spin-off from his RuneQuest game, but hadn't been able to because the MB game got there first. By 2013, the trademark and RPG was owned by Moondance Publications. They had to step in to put an end to an unauthorised 25th anniversary edition of HeroQuest that Spanish company GameZone Miniatures had tried to launch via Kickstarter. It turned out that GameZone had rights to the Spanish name for the game, but literally nothing else. The Kickstarter was cancelled and a series of troubles ensued. GameZone did eventually release a game called SioQuest, apparently in honour of HeroQuest. After all that, you might be forgiven for thinking that Moondance publications would hold on tightly to the HeroQuest trademark for all eternity, but that wasn't the case. In 2020, they announced that the game would be discontinued, to be replaced with a new edition called Quest Worlds. Now, why would that be necessary? Because, of course, 2020 was also when Hasbro, owners of everything that was once MB Games, made an announcement of their own. HeroQuest was coming back. The Hasbro relaunch was funded via their HasLab platform and released under their subsidiary Avalon Hill. It included not just the base game, but updated versions of many of the expansions and even more new material. The only thing missing was that this game was categorically not set in the Warhammer world. In fact, every reference or allusion to any Games Workshop IP was purged from the game. GW was not involved in this reboot at all. This would be a Hasbro project only. The reboot has been a major success and has understandably generated a lot of buzz and interest, maybe even as much as the original 1989 release. Much like Advanced HeroQuest, given the scale of this new HeroQuest game, it really deserves a deep dive of its own. If Stephen Baker's intention was to take the best bits of a D&D introductory experience and put it into a game box, I think that it's fair to say HeroQuest was a resounding success. In my experience, everyone has heard of HeroQuest, and even if you've not played a board game or rolled a dice in anger since you were a kid, you've probably still got a HeroQuest story to share. It also created a generation of lifelong gamers. Many would go on to D&D, Many would go on to the kind of games that were inspired by HeroQuest, like Keys to the Kingdom or Ian Livingston's Legend of Zagor, and still others would go on to Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000. For me, this was a stepping stone from HeroQuest and Space Crusade to Space Hulk and Warhammer Quest, and then on to Warhammer Fantasy Battle. But there's one thing that we've probably all got in common, and that's rolling double ones on the movement dice getting stuck in the corridor, and knowing that the gargoyles killing your friends in the other room. Well, that and some of the best gameplay experiences of our lives. I have thoroughly enjoyed researching and it's been a real joy to share this history of HeroQuest. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like, please leave a comment, I read them all and I love hearing your stories of gameplay experiences. Uh, feel free to subscribe or a super thanks would be very muchly appreciated. I've got some really interesting stuff coming up down the pipeline, so hopefully you can stay with the channel for that. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. At length, Hasbro sought adventure in distant lands and trod the jeweled games of rival publishers beneath its sandaled feet. It would found its own hero quest, but would it wear this crown upon a troubled brow?